and light. Hi, thank you guys for joining us. My name is Dr. Rasha Kamian. I'd like to uh, thank the Global Summit and for all our viewers today, we have a very amazing and interesting speaker with us today. Uh, we will be uh, interviewing Dr. Uchi Odiatu, and uh, he is joining us from Toran uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, Dr. Odiatu has a really extensive background in health, fitness. He is a practicing DMD in Toronto. He is the author of The Miracle of Health. He is an international lecturer on health and wellness. You may have seen him on radio, on television, discussing nutrition, stress management, and uh, patient lifestyle habits and how that impacts uh, treatment outcomes. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how are you doing, doctor? How's life in Toronto today? Uh, I'm doing good. I already did a little workout today. I did some interval training. Again, only five minutes, which is uh, in some of the new science, exercise physiology, and how it's equal to an hour. So I had some water. I, I'm ready to go. I'm I'm on fire. So wonderful. Yeah, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, we we all know that our nutrition, mental health, physical health, they all um, correlate to overall health. And right now, in a time where all of uh, dentists and our patients need to have optimal health, I think this is a really relevant topic, and I uh, really want to hear your insight. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, uh, starting off, about what your uh, early the, the, the routines are during the day when you wake up what are the first couple of things that you do and how do you set your start uh, start your day off for a productive and healthy day well great question well first thing I do is I celebrate because um, every day 235,000 people don't wake up so um, you know 235,000 human beings don't wake up to enjoy another day so I'm alive I look down on my hands I am I am celebrating and then what I do is I do some stretches there's four stretches I do every morning and what it does, it opens up your spine, opens up the lymphatic system, gets you breathing, gets you grateful. And um, then I move to get some small drink of water. And then just over the last eight weeks, quarantined at home, like social distancing, I'll actually jump on a, a stationary bike and do five minutes of interval training, which basically the new science on HIT, high intensity interval training, says it's equivalent to an hour. So, the, so five mm -hmm. minutes is actually better for you and will get you fit faster than an hour of steady state training. So latest technology, easy to do. And uh, so I, I love sharing it with my busy dental colleagues. Yeah, actually I hear a lot from actually people of different cultures uh, that they drinking water in the morning, one of the first things that you should do. And I've actually heard that it's better if it's you know warm uh, or lukewarm. And some people actually add some lemons and uh, other components to it. Have you heard of the same? What are you, what's been your experience? Yeah, there's, oh, there's, okay. there's many different ways to do it. I think a lot of people, it, it, nutrition changes. When you think of medical practice, dental practice, if you look back to 50 years ago in medicine, half the procedures they were doing then we no longer do. And I think sometimes people are so surprised when nutrition changes, but like any health uh, component of science, there's changes, there's an evolution. Like even think of um, astronomy, they used to say the earth was the center of the universe. So uh, so when they say hot water, cold water, cayenne, pepper, lemon, apple cider vinegar, I think everyone tries to say whatever they're doing is the answer, but it's evolving. We all have different metabolisms. We have different microbiome, and that's one of my key topic today. We all have a different microbiome. So you and I share a third of the single-celled species in our bodies. The other two-thirds are different depending on our activity, stress, sleep, and the kind of foods we eat. So that's why you can't say this is good for everyone. You got to look at their metabolism, their lifestyle, the geography, you know, what's their activity level? Like, like that, the 102 pound grandmother in Vancouver doesn't need eight glasses of water like the 310 pound lineman for Georgia's state uh, football team. So I'm a big believer in individualizing it and creating a, a, almost like a, a blueprint depending on the person's activity level, size, goals, age. You know, so th there's more to it than just saying eight glasses of water. So when people say eight glasses of water, I'm thinking old school, 1990s, MC Hammer, you know, vanilla mm -hmm. ice, you know. So it's uh, uh, the new age of nutrition is adapting it to individual people, you know, and time zone. It's, 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 it's amazing how time zone changes uh, nutrition demands. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we, we customize everything else. We customize our treatment plans. We customize uh, our, our, our accessories. But when it comes to nutrition, 
uh, we try to create these uh, blanket statements that should that, that people say applies to everyone. I guess it, that, that's not the case. I mean, every individual is different. Uh, lifestyle, habits, environment. Uh, so, so I think the nutrition and exercises and physical activity have to be customized as well to the respective person. Yeah, exactly. Some people say, do I eat breakfast? Do I not eat breakfast? All depends on your your energy style. Are you a morning lark or a night owl? Uh, people say, do I do I lift weights as my number one exercise or do we cardio? Depends what your age is, depending on what your goals are. Uh, people say, do I take a probiotic? You don't need a probiotic if you have a balanced vegetable intake. Uh, you have no dysbiosis, you have no bloating, and you have good digestion. But if someone has stress in their life, frequent use of antibiotics, and they don't exercise, they could benefit from a probiotic. So you're right, there is no blanket statement, but I do believe though there's common foundational principles. Like um, everyone needs to sleep between seven hours and nine hours a night, unless you have that uh, BHLEHE41 gene, which means you can get by on three hours. But the other 99.95% of people need seven to nine hours and ideally sleeping at nighttime, or they've shown there's a complete disruption of physiology. And that's why, you know, I, the, when I talk to uh, your side like about- we, uh, It looks like your, your, your connection might be a little bit weak, but um, I, I wanted to follow up with a, with a question, it, speaking of breakfast. So growing up, uh, there was a saying in my household, my parents taught me, they said, you eat, you eat a large breakfast, medium lunch and a small dinner. And the saying was, uh, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a peasant. And then as of the last two years, uh, I, I've, been, I've been reversing that. So now with intermittent fasting, uh, they say, you know, you just want to continue that, that cleanse that your body's going through. So in the morning, have some warm water and some, uh, maybe some lemon juice uh, or just water alone and have some coffee with some uh, uh, ghee butter and MTC oil. And that'll carry you until the afternoon and allow your body to continue its digestion. So it's interesting the the you know the vast difference uh, in opinions that we get. What, which would you say as far as eating in the morning? Would you say better to have a lighter meal in the morning or have a heavier meal and then just transition it uh, throughout the day? See, it really depends on your goals. Like it, it depends on your goals. So it, it's a question of whether you're w what you want to focus on. So um, intermittent fasting, we do know one thing. A lot of people are very dogmatic about the 16 and 8, 6 and 1, 5 and 2, and the, the, they're ahead of the science. All the science says is we shouldn't be eating all day. All the science says we need to take a bigger break between meals. And that whole 1990s, early 2000s idea of six small meals a day is out the door. They're saying it was wrong. Like cavemen and cave women, you think of hundreds of thousands of years in human history, many times we didn't eat at all. And our bodies are geared to not eat for 30 days or we ate once a day. So it's the breakfast companies that said, eat a big breakfast. Like, and it makes economic sense. If you and I owned um, a breakfast company, we want everyone to eat breakfast, but that may not be the best for every body type. And it may not be the best for everyone's goals, especially if they're eating a big lunch and a big dinner and they eat before bed, you know? So um, intermittent fasting is new, it works. Uh, since 1935, scientists have shown, anytime people restrict their calories, you can live longer and you slow down mitochondrial decay and it slows down organ dysfunction. And it even it's been shown in rodent studies to slow down cognitive decline with age, which is normal. People always think my brain, my 80 year old grandfather is starting to get a little slow in the brain. Well, his knees are slow, his heart's slow, his skin, we, we all age, but you can slow down age related organ decline by caloric restriction. So that's where intermittent fasting came in. People, if you actually take a bigger break between meals, you can slow down age relating decline in multiple organ systems, tissues and cells. But in terms of the exact hours, we're ahead of the science. We're ahead of the science. Amazing. Uh, well, that's good to know. I think that, that'll be my motivation to uh, <laughs> reduce my caloric intake daily. Um, I, I want to hear a little bit about your book. Uh, tell us about your book. What did you cover? What are the main uh, main points that you discuss in your in your book? Well, The Miracle Health, is, it's more a philosoph philosophy. It's a mindset. Um, many books are tailored to an exact regimen, like the Pritikin diet, the Atkins diet, the Paleo diet, the Keto diet. Uh, the whole 30 diet. And it's funny how uh, all these diets, their details come and go. So the book focuses on principles. It's foundational things. Like the, the values and principles in life don't change. You know, human life is valuable. Um, we need to have deep reverence for the human body. Um, it needs to take a break from activity. Um, activity is good. Too much activity is not good. Even the Tao Te Ching, written like thousands of years ago, said, if you veer off and go to extremes, you'll always have imbalance. So the best way is moderation. And then 
a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, Hippocrates said moderation in all things. So when people fast for days and people do ultra marathon, you're pushing your physiology to off the beaten path and you will have issues. So moderation is everything. And I really believe that, you know, what you do once in a while does not matter. What you do every day that is more important in terms of food, nutrition, exercise. So every now and then you can do an all nighter if you have to, if you've got a new project, you've got a new business you want to get off the ground. But to do to have multiple nights in a row of poor sleep, it's definitely going to sabotage health, low testosterone, make you more insulin resistant. Uh, increase cortisol, increase blood pressure, increase body breakdown, increase cellular aging. So, but the, the stats out there, those 17 hours a night, sleeping at night is the best thing. So I, I believe in foundational principles. So I look at principles like sleep, rest, regular physical activity, and whole food, good, good food nutrition. So those are my four pillars, like sleep, um, managing stress, good nutrition, and exercise. And I think many dentists, if, if we don't talk to patients about their lifestyle, we'll often be frustrated with uh, peri-implantitis, we'll be frustrated with the fact that things aren't integrating well. Meanwhile, we don't realize we're working on a shift worker who's, um, who hates his job and who doesn't exercise. So he'll have, a, he'll have a higher levels of background inflammation, which will sabotage almost every uh, treatment goal we have. And if we don't address it, we're pulling our hair out trying to find out why is there bleeding under the pontic? Why is there bleeding around uh, the abutment? Well, he's a shift worker. 30% of our patients work sh all night or rotating shifts. So they have a background level of chronic inflammation. So if dentists aren't looking at that in their, their, as part of the, the new patient exam and they're just, they have this blanket treatment plan of you know, complete rehabilitation and not looking at lifestyle, uh, many times they'll be frustrated with the results. It's very interesting. So I, I have a protocol when placing implants or doing surgeries myself. You know, I put them on the Paradex a couple of days before, you know, uh, load them up with antibiotics maybe before the procedures. Um, never really focused on uh, addressing sleep issues and, and lifestyle issues leading up to surgery and then after. I'd love to hear about, uh, yeah, what, your, what are your recommendations? Any specific supplements, sleep, exercise, what, what do you recommend? Oh, oh, for sure. The human microbiome is the, is the new science. You know, the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland uh, did the first phase of the human microbiome projects when it started in 2007, went to 2012. And literally, Dr. Masmanian in California, the California Institute of Technology said, what they learned about the bacteria, the single-celled organisms in our body, is shaking the foundation of medicine and shaking the foundation of nutrition. So basically, if we don't talk about person's nutrient intake, we don't talk about the sleep habits, we don't talk about the physical activity habits, and the fact that um, this is key, um, uh, our bi bacteria, the single-celled organisms in our stomach, they have a foundational relationship with fiber. And this is not nutrition or di di dietetics. This is immunologists and microbiologists said our bacteria, which have literally been on the planet for three and a half billion years, um, they have a primordial primitive foundational relationship with fiber. That's all they want. And basically 97% of people, 97% of people do not eat the daily recommended amount of fiber, which basically means they have a background level of inflammation because bacteria ferment fiber and they make short chain fatty acids, short chain fatty acids are the most potent anti-inflammatory agent the body makes. So SCFAs, short, short chain fatty acids, are the most potent anti-inflammatory agent the body makes. And if 97% of North Americans, 97% of dentists, 97% of patients do not eat enough fiber every day, the average may be 10 grams, what happens is they'll have a background level of inflammation which will sabotage every treatment plan we have. So we're pulling out a hair going, why is there bleeding? We're pulling out a hair, why we can't get a good impression? I'm pulling out my hair, trying to figure out why this, uh, why this mm -hmm. implant's not integrating well or why there's peri-implantitis. You didn't find out if the person needs vegetables. All they eat is meat and potatoes. So low fiber, inflamed, um, poor results, and we're frustrated. Um, so my mission is to share with my colleagues to look at the bigger picture. And you know, no patient leaves their marriage, their relationships, their food habits, their stress habits, and their exercise habits in the car when they come into the office. They bring it all in. But because we just have this way of let's restore, um, if you don't look at the social, nutrition, um, stress level side, frustrations develop, uh, treatment plans go awry, and uh, the results we get aren't as ideal as commensurate with our clinical and our clinical excellence. So th th there you have it in, in a nutshell. I have a question. Uh, you, you cut out there briefly, but I want to know how long before, for example, if I have a patient coming in to place you know, 10, 12 implants, how long before the actual placement of the implants 
And how long after is, it, is there a critical period? How long before do they have to start changing some of their habits? I mean, ideally, this this, this will be something they do long term. Um, sure. But maybe is there a period of window that's really critical uh, when performing procedures, specifically, uh, you know, surgeries? Yeah, great, great question. I, you know, people realize, you know, Hippocrates, you know, 2,300 years ago said, all disease begins in the gut. So 300 BC, Hippocrates, the first doctor said, all disease begins in the gut. Uh, you are what you eat. So literally, you have a patient with poor eating habits, which is almost everyone. One in three North Americans eats junk food every day. 70% of adults don't eat fruit every day. And fruit, according to the Global Burden of Disease, that was written up in The Lancet in 2012, showed fruit could actually modify the health of 5 million people worldwide every year. So um, they've actually shown three days of binge eating junk food. You know, we, Morgan Spurlock did that um, supersize me a couple of years ago. Yeah. Well, they've shown yes, if you eat junk food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for three days, after 72 hours, one third or up to 40% of your resident flora have vanished. They're gone. And because mm -hmm. your flora um, train your immune system through the Treg cells, and because your flora, your bacteria communicate with your brain, the vagus nerve and the enteric nervous system, now you're working with a patient with um, one hand behind your back with great tools, great training, and wondering why the results aren't there. So within two or three days, a person can revamp their microbiome because the bacteria is very ephemeral. But I would say if for good success, I would say I'd, I'd want someone on a good nutritional intake for 30 days, 30 days of good sleep, 30 days of good nutrition, and we'll find the results uh, way better. And it's a small investment. Prevention is cheap compared to... Uh, replacing an implant or someone not being happy with, um, you know, chronic bleeding around an abutment. So um, I'm all for looking at those, you know, stress, sleep, nutrition, and physical activity levels. And that's what I teach in my courses. So I've, I've done about almost 500 lectures in the last 15 years in about seven countries. And um, people always think nutrition is all about looking good. It's a, it's a small part of nutrition. It's really about physiology, um, having a body that does, doesn't have chronic levels of inflammation, and having a, a body that responds well to our treatments. So I have, I have two questions. Uh, first and foremost, that's a huge concern, us now coming back to uh, the normal flow of things, trying to see patients again, offices are opening up now, and all of our patients, including all the dentists, have been quarantined for the last month and a half, uh, eating probably poorly, lack of sunlight, lack of physical exercise, and so I imagine going back into uh, the normal flow of things, especially in dentistry with the aerosol formation and the, the increased risks that we face uh, in combination with uh, probably the poor eating habits and stress and uh, lack of exercise and sun for the last month is probably not going to be a good combination. Uh, what are your thoughts no. on that? Yeah, it's, it's going to be the inflamed and tired working on the inflamed and tired. So uh, at least it'll be even. But uh, but I'd say if as dentists prepare to go back, I'd say um, get, do a daily physical activity program. I would say I would say there's about seven things I'd recommend. A daily salad. You want to get your fiber up because you want to be less inflamed. I would say wear a sleep mask at nighttime. A sleep mask allows your brain to make your pineal gland to make more melatonin. You'll have deeper sleep, better immune system. You don't want to be going back and you know uh, do all kinds of um, high end surgeries. You're no matter how good your systems are, you're still exposed to viral and bacterial yeah. loads. Um, you don't want to be tired. You don't want you want your immune system to be on fire. So I would say take a daily probiotic for the next 30 days. I would say get out and do a 30 minute walk every day. I would say get seven to nine hours of sleep every night. I would say to manage stress stress by having some kind of breathing program, either like a Tai Chi style fusion program. You can find those on YouTube. I would say also to um, uh, maybe even incorporate. Uh, drinking more water because even anytime that we're not getting our, our nutri nutrient needs mess, the body's stressed out and cortisol rises. And cortisol basically shrinks your hippocampus. Um, this is from Dr. John Rattay, Harvard psychiatrist, and uh, Norman Doidge wrote a book called Changing Your Brain. He said, um, um, anytime you, you glucocorticoids or, or cortisol in the body shrinks your hippocampus. And that hippocampus is where you store short-term memory. And it happens immediately. Like if, if you're at a cocktail party and you're stressed about how people perceive you, and you go to introduce yourself to someone and you're all nervous about it, they tell you their name, you tell them your name, you leave, you turn around and you've forgotten their name. The hippocampus right. did not store the name because your cortisol was high and your hippocampus needs serotonin. It does not need cortisol. So cortisol sabotages short-term memory. So this is powerful stuff. Like you wanna be, be perceived as being smart, stable, 
alert, calm, fit, uh, rested people. And we're all going back tired and wired. And the COVID-19 is not just the 19 for COVID. 19 is the 19 pounds everyone gained over the last seven weeks. Yeah, <laughs> at least. You know, it's really interesting. You mentioned uh, uh, the melatonin and the pineal gland. It's something that uh, really has been of interest to me, especially the, the amount of blue light that we see uh, from our phones, our uh, you know computers, and, and you know I actually purchased these glasses. I was looking for them, but I, I'm sure everyone can find them on Amazon. So I wear these special blue light blocking yeah. glasses. Uh, have you seen those? Yeah, orange glasses. Harvard has some studies on it. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on those? They work. I they wear work. <laughs> You know, they work. They said with, within an hour of bedtime. It, what it does, it, it gives your brain sleep messages. Um, to give an idea, um, through you think of a million years of human history or thousands of years, however your whichever theory you prescribe to, for hundreds of thousands, if not a million years, as soon as sundown was there, the only light we had was fire. The only light our brains got for the last million years was fire, or orange red light of fire. So mm -hmm. it's only the last 30 years that we've had blue light from computers and halogen lights and now LED lights and now people with webcams and now we have iPhones. I, I know people check their phones in the middle of the night and it basically, it's like having a lighthouse beacon into your brain. You're, and people go, well, I couldn't get back to sleep. Did you check your email? Yeah, but why, how'd that bother me? Well, your million year old brain thought it was mm -hmm. noon because you looked at the sun at four o'clock in the morning. I didn't look at the sun. Yeah, you looked at your your, your iPhone, you checked your emails. So. Those orange glasses protect your pineal gland from blue light. And blue light basically tells our brain it's daylight, it's daylight. And you can't ignore that. The minute your brain gets daylight messages all evening from looking at computers, your 60 inch TV, your plasma TV, all the brain does is you're not sleeping, it's daylight. It goes against our DNA to try and sleep at night after looking at screens. It just doesn't make sense to your body. And it completely throws off your circadian rhythm. Uh, I, I know. I know, you know, once you get into that rhythm, you don't even need the alarm clock, right? Like, uh, I'm sure many of others have, have uh, once you get into that routine, I wake up maybe a couple of minutes uh, before my alarm goes off. So once right. we get into that rhythm, we train our brain and uh, our pineal gland, and the light completely throws it off. I think the other thing is just reaching deep sleep. Uh, I think a lot of people have a tendency to maybe have a glass of wine or, uh, or uh, you know, uh, maybe as as we have gained these 19 pounds, uh, you know, the airway get a little bit more blocked now, so we're not getting the full oxygen, especially positional sleep apnea is a huge concern for a lot of people. So they're not reaching that deep sleep. So I think the combination of the blue lights and, and the lack of uh, really good oxygen deep sleep uh, can really take a toll. Well, also the lack of movement, you know, the lack of movement, we're not moving very much. We, we spent 70% of our waking time sitting, which means now we have more fluids in our lower body. So when you go down to lie down at nighttime, all these fluids move to our upper body around our neck. Literally, we're, we're choking ourselves to death. Um, mm. Also, the alcohol at nighttime oh, sure, yeah, but does relax the oral pharynx. But uh, neuroscientists, um, Matthew Walker, Berkeley, said that also what, uh, what uh, drinking alcohol does, it, it lowers your REM. So you think of you know, rapid eye mood sleep, big deal. I'm dreaming about my retirement. No, REM is not just dreaming about your retirement. During REM sleep, we, we process emotion and we process memory. So during REM sleep, we take short-term memories out of our hippocampus and move them into our, our cortex for long-term adhesion. So anyone who drinks before bedtime, and on top of that, people who have apnea, people who snore, on top of that, people who sleep in a room that's too bright, on top of that, people sleep in a room that's too, uh, too warm, on top of that, people that have watched um, Sean Hannity or Wolf Blitzer on their TV, which inflames them. So now they have elevated levels of cortisol and high levels of cortisol are incompatible with melatonin. So anytime you're irritated, melatonin is lower. So that being said, people aren't sleeping well. And sleep, good sleep is a hallmark of people who age well, people who have a good brain, good testosterone, good growth hormone, uh, good retention of uh, memories, uh, slowing down aging. So it's not just the wine. We're basically sabotaging our, literally our vitality with almost every modern habit. And it's really sabotaging our success. So some people are wondering why they can't break through that 100 grand a year salary cap. It's because physiologically, they have a poor memory, poor emotion, um, they have poor vitality, their immune systems are poor, and uh, they have cravings, uh, they're uh, distracted. It's impossible to earn well if you're distracted, tired, wired, and have a poor memory. 
So that's why I think that I read a report where 85% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies exercise. So 85% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies exercise and they earn anywhere from $2 million to $200 million a year. While the average North American, um, only 10% of them exercise and the average income in America is 55,000 for a family of four. So I'm not saying if you get a flat stomach, you'll actually start being a millionaire, but it's definitely you're well on your way to having a better functioning brain by exercising. So the whole idea of a dumb jock is outdated. It's like the flat earth society. It's like um, MC hammer pants, you know, it's outdated. The new style is regular physical activity to have a good brain, especially if you're in charge of a team, if you have 1500 patients, if you're in charge of a, a, a company or in charge of a nation, you know, physical activity, it, people exercise to manage stress, to have better brains. Now, I, I want to talk to you about something interesting I heard on a TED Talks is, is how you uh, come out of your sleep and, and at what points throughout the day uh, and, and what things you can do to increase your brain capacity and making good decisions. So two of the topics they discussed was, I believe it was called the Delta State. As you are coming up out of sleep, you're, before you're fully awake, there's this period where you, your brain actually, it's like being in the shower. You now you're sitting in the, you're in the shower and all these amazing ideas and thoughts, you're kind of uh, in between you know, reality and then kind of letting your brain wander a little bit. So one of the tendencies of people when they first wake up and when they're in that, I uh, believe Delta state is they immediately jump on their phones. So now they are checking emails and responding and, 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 you know, seeing their notifications. And so one of the things I try to do the first hour is just shut off my cell phone and be, uh, and allow myself to kind of go through that transition and allow my brain to uh, think openly. And then the other thing is decision fatigue. And I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on decision fatigue or, or the concept is, you can only make so many good decisions throughout the day. So one of the reasons why you see a lot of these, you know, really um, uh, amazing CEOs and, and really productive people, they they wear the same thing every single day. It's one less decision we have to make in picking yeah. out our outfit. Uh, people who don't drive to work and they don't you don't have to worry about making a thousand decisions on which lane to pick. Um, so what are your thoughts on those two points? Yeah, I think most of us think the brain is supposed to work all the time. You know, we, we're so surprised when a someone who's 55 can no longer have a good memory, or they were so surprised that we're, that we're so bad at uh, remembering names when you get introduced. Um, most of us don't think you can actually make your brain stronger. Actually, medicine and science didn't even know there was stem cells in the brain until 20 years ago. So in 1999, Erickson and Page saw there were stem cells um, in people that were terminally ill. And they, they saw that um, um, on, the, on autopsy of these brains, what they marked with a special dye called BRDU, and they saw there was baby stem cells in the hippocampus. And now they found stem cells everywhere, this triatum and a number of other areas in the brain. So they know now the brain can totally reinvent itself. It's neuroplasticity. But most of us, mm -hmm. uh, most of us don't eat well for even fitness anyway, so let's forget that. So but most people think you can actually train your brain to perform better. Most people don't realize you can train your brain to work better. You can do certain things to make, to support good brain health. And one of them I said, it's called the hypnagogic state. When you wake up in the morning, you're kind of still foggy. It's called the hypnagogic state. You're better off almost setting the tone for your day. You know, Robin Sharma, off a book called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, said, how you, how you start your day sets the tone for your day. I think Oprah Winfrey mm -hmm. said the same thing, and she's worth like $3 billion. So if you talk about success leaving clues, I would say when you get up in the morning, instead of being at the, at the whim and the bounce of someone else's demands, like emails and, um, and pings and alerts, you, you set the tone yourself. Be grateful right away. Um, start waking the body slowly. Move the ankles around. You know, take a deep breath in, you know, gratitude, thoughts of gratitude. And this is actually research from Dr. Sonia Laborski, the University of California. Feelings of gratitude is incompatible with stress, anger, resentment, or irritation. So as you get up, you have feelings of gratitude for another day. You roll your ankles around. Uh, you can still pick up your phone, but first say hello to you and be grateful first. And think of maybe two things that you want to get done today. And that basically sets the tone. It, like, it's like the set of the sale of the day. What are the two things I want to get done today? All else doesn't matter at that point. So um, there's ways to feed your body. There's ways to breathe. There's ways to exercise, to increase your brain performance. Um, and again, as dentists, we're high performers. I, I say we're like elite high performance race cars. So many of us treat our bodies like an afterthought. Just, you know, we talk about, oh, I, I just, my body is just something. It's a carcass. I drag through my whole life and then they bury me. Well, if you treat your body like a high performance race car and your brain, not only will it perform well, it'll perform well past your friends. You'll have better earning power, better memory. You have higher emotional intelligence because you dream deeper. 
And um, they, they said that emotional intelligence is more important than IQ. Even um, Albert Einstein said imagination is more important than intelligence. So when we start having better dreams, we start processing emotion better, better memory, we start eating better and start setting our morning up for success, we can enjoy more of everything in this life. And ultimately clinical success, when we go back to work and we really have to perform, and we've been drinking wine, eating hot dogs, eating pizza and watching Netflix, and we expect this body to perform well, and it's gonna be tired and wired and exhausted. The second day in, we'll have fuzzy thoughts, you know? So I wanted to talk to you about how to measure this. Is this measurable? Um, we're talking about the, the, the bacteria in our gut, in, in, in the oral atmosphere, uh, you know, the, the oral flora. Um, do you have any kind of recommendations on specific measurement tools or how do we gauge, you know, how things are improving and where we're at? Yeah, good question. And that's basically, if the science is so new, we don't know. And I think a lot of dentists, we have such inquiring minds. We want to know what's measurable. What does this work? How can, how can I find this? Um, what's the benchmarks? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. All we know is, it's like for me right now, I use electricity every room in the house. I flick the switch on. I barely know what ohms and impedance is. I don't know how electricity works. However, I use electricity all the time. I don't know really how my heart beats, but I trust it works all the time. But I do things though, I, there's certain guidelines to make my brain work better. So in the meantime, I just know the science is very early. It's very foundational. But so I think a lot of dentists, because you have a thing called um, intellectual disease. We know too much about some stuff. So we apply our all knowing knowledge to everything. Um, I, I know a dentist wanted to buy a set of headphones and he, he spent six weekends researching the best headphones. I'm thinking like, just ask your 18 year old son and you'll be done. Instead of spending 32 hours trying to find headphones, wireless, Bose, uh, Seinhauser. So I think looking for the details, we get lost in the detail. A lot of dentists get lost in the details. We lose the forest. And meanwhile, they can start being fit, happy, healthy, rested, alert, even more attractive. They said people who sleep better are more attractive. They did a study at uh, University of Illinois and they took 20 people of different levels of attractiveness. And they had a, a group that weren't asked who was more attractive. They just said, who would you like to ask for directions, which is always usually an attractiveness marker. And, and half of the people that they asked who were attractive, not attractive, half of them slept four hours, the other half slept eight hours. Mm -hmm. Everyone who slept eight hours was deemed to be more attractive than people who slept four hours. Even the Brad Pitts and the Angelo Jolie types were deemed not, not a person I wanted to approach. So get being rested, fed well, managing stress, exercising makes everything perform better. Even our chance of, even our chance of attracting a mate, which is basically the all driving force of all our actions. You know, people talk about, I wanna have a good practice, but they said, if you look at evolution, all, all our species is about is making another person. So, you know, we have a nice car to attract a mate. We get a good job so we can provide for a mate. We eat well so we can have the strength to mate, but uh, we sleep well so we can be attractive to get a mate. You know, we look at um, prettiness and attractiveness and proportions. So um, being, being physically well, being mentally alert, managing stress is ultra important. And I think because some of the science is still new, if we try and start finding what's the best probiotic or what's, what's the difference between a prebiotic and probiotic and what kind of fermented foods work best, we're going to miss the point. Just use the early foundational principles and you'll be well on your way. So when by the time we're so start jogging, when we're running, the science will have caught up. But by that point, we've already been living healthily for two, three, four, five years and reaping all the benefits of eating fiber, doing cardio, doing strength training, sleeping seven to nine hours a night, wearing a sleep mask, wearing orange glasses before bedtime, taking a probiotic. You know, so all these things make sense to me and the science is in but not completely in as to why, not completely in as to why. Tell me a little bit about some supplements that you recommend, I know, or, or do you recommend any specific? So probiotics are, are one way. How do you recommend we get our probiotics? I've seen the pills, I've seen the yogurts, I've seen uh, different, different ways. Uh, what are your recommendations on that? Well, well, before there was supplements, there was food. So food is number one. The body recognizes food. When the body, when your when your stomach, when your bacteria, when your enzymes see avocado, they don't look for a list of ingredients. But the minute you look at a packaged or processed or canned food, now the body's got to look like, how do I digest citric acid? How would I? How do I digest um, soybean oil? How do I digest high fructose corn syrup? How do I digest aspartame? So now the body gets confused, and then anytime the body's confused, stress goes up, digestion slows down. When digestion slows down, guess what happens? 
we hyperabsorb calories. Instead of food moving through you in a regular amount of fashion, now the food is in your system six hours longer. So now your body has more time to digest food and now you hyperabsorb calories. So anytime we have a lot of list of ingredients, the body's trying to figure out, the body now keeps eating and you hyperabsorb calories. So I'd say food is number one. So whole food is number one. Second is supplements. But even supplements, again, even when you think of prebiotics and probiotics, fermented foods, which have been around for 2,000 years, the Romans would actually ferment foods to make them last longer. They've now shown, though, fermented foods have prebiotic qualities, which, are, which set up an environment for good bacteria, and they have probiotic qualities. Probiotics are life-giving, life-enhancing bacteria, which help us digest food. They help make serotonin. 85% of serotonin is made in the stomach. 80% um, of our immune system is in, this, in the GI tract. This is actually Dr. Robin Chutkin, Dr. Emron Mayer, Julia Enders. These are all gastroenterologists. Up to 85% of serotonin is made in the stomach. So your sense of well-being, and anyone who has good serotonin interacts well with people. Anyone who has good serotonin is an effective leader because they inspire people. Anyone who has good serotonin is emotionally even keeled, and you're more motivating and inspiring to your team or your patients, and you have better authentic dialogue. So being a good leader actually starts in your stomach. The, the, the healthier, more stable, the more diverse flora you have, the more serotonin you can make. So these are all powerful things. So it starts with food. But so I would say a probiotic is needed if I'm working with a, a picky eater, if I'm working with someone who's been on frequent antibiotics, if I'm working with someone who has dysbiosis, which is bloating, GERD, anyone who has um, upset stomach, anyone who has SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, or anyone who has associated um, antibiotic associated diarrhea. Like a good number of people, when they've taken antibiotic for pre med or five days or seven or 10 days of amoxicillin, up to a third of the bacteria is missing anywhere from six months to a year. And for some people, it never returns. The, some bacteria, once they're gone, they're gone. So some people are, are, are physically microbiome challenged the rest of their lives when they've been on. I, I've read a story where by age three, by age two, the average person's been on antibiotics three times. By age 18, the average human in North America has been on antibiotics 20 times. So um, we have a lot of physiological storms with our patients and uh, many dentists don't understand it. I, I like to bring clarity towards it. Every webinar inspires people to think, maybe I should eat more fiber. Maybe I should go to bed earlier. And I've done my job when I get people thinking, I'm gonna take better care of me. And now you become a better caregiver because Taking care of patients starts with self-care. And that's why in the plane, when the flight attendant says, in the event of an emergency and the, and the cabin depressurizes and the plane's going down, don't put it on the dependent person you're traveling with. Put it on yourself first. So I take care of me first, and now I can take care of everyone first. So going back into the, the transition, back into opening up our offices and seeing patients, Give us some concrete recommendations. Give us five things that we can do immediately as of now, especially now, uh, go, you know, transitioning back. Some of us have already started. Some of us have probably a couple of weeks left. Uh, I know myself, our, my office opens up in about two weeks. What can I do starting today? Uh, give us five things that we can do immediately to, to not only boost our immune system, but set, up, set ourselves up. Because I don't see a vaccine coming out uh, anytime yeah. soon. We're all going to no. get exposed to that somehow yeah. or another. I think it's going to be impossible to avoid this. So how do we set ourselves up for success? Okay. I would say start developing regular sleep patterns. You know, don't watch two movies on Netflix and go to bed at 2 and get up at 11. I would say get regular sleep patterns, the similar sleep pattern that your work style would be. So if it's going to bed at 10, 11, getting up at 7 or 8, like just start approximating a regular sleep pattern. That's probably number one. That's foundational. That's foundational, getting a sleep pattern. Set, set a schedule. Uh, and, and most days, like I still have a late night if you have to, you're talking to someone in a different time zone, but start, let's start looking at a regular sleep schedule, number one. Um, and how, I would actually, uh, sorry, I, I wanna be very specific now. So six hours, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, what is your well, recommendation? The science says anything less than seven sabotages memory. Anything less than seven, you don't get four cycles of sleep, you know, each cycle being 90 minutes. Anything less than seven, you don't get 100 minutes of REM. Rapid eye movement sleep basically um, helps you process emotion and process memory. Both things make you a more attractive healthcare provider. When do you ever say, when do, when do you ever brag, my doctor has a poor memory and he fly, she flies off the handle all the time. So you, only, you process emotion and you process memory during REM. And sleep scientists are saying we need 100 minutes a night. 100 minutes a night for good memory and good emotional control. 
So you can only get that with at least seven hours. At least okay. seven hours. Minimum, minimum seven hours. Of seven hours. Got it. Sorry, we kind of blanked out there a bit. Sorry, internet's being a little uh internet's being a little bit uh so uh, until we Sorry, you, you cut out for a short period. So a minimum of seven hours, try to make it consistent, uh, avoid you know uh, blue lights, television an hour before you go to bed. And uh, yeah. if you can help it, maybe avoid alcohol as well. Within two hours by time. And if you want to drink, drink, but have it with food. You know, the, the French paradox, that didn't say booze any time of the day. What they recommended was, is to have, if you're gonna eat some alcohol, have it with cheese or nuts or have it with a meal. But anytime you have alcohol on its own, what happens is you end up boosting uh, blood sugar and then your pancreas pumps out insulin and now you have low blood sugar. So you don't sleep as deep, poor memory, less REM, and you're, you have your oral pharynx being loose. So still have your booze, but have it with food. Always have, your, have it with food. All right. So number one, get good sleep, seven hours minimum. Number two. Yeah, sure. uh, number two, so daily physical activity. I don't mean you gotta, you gotta do a marathon every day. All I was saying is minimum 30 minutes. So it could be a walk. So minimum 30 minute walk daily for sure. They've shown regular physical activity boosts a neurotransmitter called BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor. The only people who have a lot of it are people who are physically active. And that's one of the reasons why CEOs exercise. It's an indirect reason, but they don't realize part of what makes exercisers have better brains. And it's, you have a better brain because the brain has more neuroplasticity. Um, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, facilitates communication between all 100 billion neurons. So anyone who's a regular exerciser has more of this material. Dr. John Rattay in Harvard called it miracle growth. So doing 30 minutes of walking a day increases the BDNF, which increases learning ability, increases neuroplasticity. It used to be called survival of the strongest back in the dinosaur time, then a survival of the fittest, then a survival of the wisest 20 years ago, now it's survival of the most adaptable. You can only adapt well if your brain has BDNF from brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and you only get that, you can't take a pill, you can't surgically implant it, you only get that with regular physical activity. So to be a good healthcare provider, I would say 30 minutes a day of any kind of physical activity. It could be walking, it could be a 30-minute YouTube exercise um, uh, video, but 30 minutes a day for the next 30 days, for sure. So that's my second one. Number two, uh, so is, is stretching uh, involved in physical activity or, or is that apart from the actual, you know, a little bit more of a high paced physical activity? Yeah, great question. Actually, there's three components to a full program and I'm, I'm certified in two different organizations. I'm also a yoga instructor and I'm also a, boot camp, a certified boot camp instructor. There's three components to a complete physical activity program, strength training, cardio, and stretching. So strength, okay. aerobic, and stretching. You gotta do all three. Very few people do all three. They said about 3% of the population does all three. So stretching's a part of it, but I wouldn't um, make it my only thing. So yoga is great, but where's the strength and the, and where, and where's the strength and the aerobic component? So you gotta look at all three. And that's why, you know, I have articles I can make available. If people wanna, you know, um, message me on Instagram, I'll make my email available if people wanna ask. But uh, those are pretty detailed structures. I'm being a certified trainer. It's more than I can right. teach in a rundown of tips, but I'd say, 30 minutes of any kind of activity. I try to make it easy because most dentists, right, we're guilty of overkill, right? Analysis by paralysis. So I'd say 30 minutes of just activity. Um, some dentists call filling the bathtub on Saturday night, pulling the plug and fighting the current exercise. That's not exercise, okay? That's just being a good guy. That's just being clean, okay? Um, so, so let's go. So regular sleep, set, set good sleep parameters, seven hours minimum. Um, 30 minutes of physical activity every day. I would say to be exact, because I know dentists like exact, have a salad every day. Have a mm. salad every day. I don't care what you put in it. The best thing for the microbiome is to have a varied salad. The more variety of ingredients in our salad, the more diverse our bacteria. They've actually shown mm. the more diverse our bacteria, the slower we age. Because naturally, diversity of the species in our stomachs goes down as we get older. So the 90-year-old has less diverse microbes than the 20-year-old. And the nine-year-old looks like ET, the 20 year old looks like Brad Pitt. So as we get older, we get less diverse as we get, we get older. So you can actually slow down the losing of diversity by eating diverse foods. Change up your food, change up the salad, romaine lettuce, arugula, um, um, spinach, uh, 
uh, you name it. So change up a salad. But I say a salad every day. Okay, so a salad every day. Salad every day, for sure. Salad every day. I would say spend at least um, five minutes a day, do nothing. Which you're saying it's easy, but most of us are checking our phone, checking Facebook, checking Instagram. I'd say spend five minutes a day just in quiet solitude, not meditation. Just sit down quietly in the sun, do nothing. And if you can actually inhale through your nose and exhale through your nose, you can actually quieten down your sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight nervous system, which all of us have on on position. And if sympathetically nervous system positions are on all the time, we get autonomic nervous system dysfunction, which basically causes adrenal fatigue and that tired, wired, older guy appearance. And you might be 30, but people look like 40. They might be 40, but they look like 55, simply because they've beaten their adrenal glands up. So that five minutes a day you spend in quiet reflection, we're not talking about, could be prayer, could be just sitting on a bench, having the sun on your face, could be just sitting by a window, looking at your fish, could be stroking your dog, but five minutes of inhaling through your nose, exhaling through your nose, and what you've done is you're switching your, your nervous system from sympathetic to parasympathetic, fight or flight to rest and digest. So I would mm -hmm. say five minutes of that would be super important, five minutes a day. Don't do 30, you'll never be able to take up the habit. You know, dentists are totally notorious for all or nothing. So I would say start off with five minutes and just enjoy it. Start and just enjoy it. So now we have sleep, we have salad, we have 30 minutes of activity, we have five minutes of quiet revolu re resolution. I would say look at how much fiber you're eating. I think the fact that 97% of us don't eat enough fiber and fiber is what is a foundational food for our microbiome and, and if I say anyone who ignores the microbiome, they have poor digestion, poor energy, brain fog, accelerated aging, too much body fat, and poor insulin control, poor blood sugar management. The minute you start feeding your body, your, your bacteria in general, what they want, which is fiber, you will do better across the board. 97% of people don't eat enough fiber, only 3% do, and that's 3% of our patients, only 3% of dentists. So I would say add an avocado a day. And people think avocado, ooch, two bucks, how's that gonna be a big part of it? An avocado a day is life-changing because an avocado is 10 grams of fiber, 10 grams mm -hmm. of fiber every day. And if you want to really piggyback that, I would add an apple. So now I have 10 plus 14, 10 plus four, that's 14 grams of fiber. 14 grams, so an avocado and apple, eat them separately than the salad. Eat a salad once a day, a big salad. 30 minutes of movement, manage your sleep better. Five minutes in quiet solitude. Now you're going back rested, ready to move, good brain, good amount of BDNF, adrenal glands starting to quieten down, and you have the ability now to adjust, and I call it hacking into the body without having to understand it all, because that's becoming a certified trainer. Don't worry about how, just think that this is why you gotta do it, and this is what you gotta do. And people will have unbounded energy in 30 days. That's wonderful. That's wonderful advice. I think, and those are easy things that we can implement. You need to take five minutes uh, in between patients. And just breathe and, and reset between uh, between patients before jumping into the next operatory. I think now that we'll have less and you know more structured, uh, hopefully one patient per hour uh, type of practices. Uh, I think that this will give us a little bit of time in between, making sure you take a good lunch, making sure you take give yourself those little breaks every couple hours. Um, I I would really love if you can send something or share something with our audience on what they can give uh, to their patients discussing these good habits. And if you can post something maybe on your Instagram or, or, or a later time, I think it would be great for us to be able to convey this information accurately to our patients and, and hopefully help them, you know, boost their immune system before we get started again. Sure, I can either provide something to Dr. Shaw or if, um, I'm not sure if I've already sent him some articles already. I'm not sure what I've sent him already. I could take a look at it, but I, I welcome, people follow me on Instagram. I, I, I give an idea. I've posted 400 times since January 1st. So I posted 400 times. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I posted 400 times is because every time, if I read an article, this is just an article on um, uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, ibuprofen. And it showed how ibuprofen um, causes uh, mucosal ulceration, bleeding, perforation, and the formation of diaphragm-like strictures in the gut lining. And this is just a side effect of taking them, especially if you abuse them, you know, more than three days in a row. You'd be surprised how many smart healthcare professionals abuse ibuprofen. So non steroidal anti-inflammatories cause tears so this article is from um, American College of Sports Medicine. It's eight years old. However, though, if I read it and print up three action steps, now that, that information has become ingrained in my brain because they've shown anytime you share something 
you go, it goes deeper into your neurons. A lot of people get information, they don't take notes, they have a 5% retention. But if I actually take notes, I increase my attention 20%. So anyone who's taken notes in this program increases their retention by 20%. But if you actually take this information and take action, you increase it to 50%. But if you also share it with someone you love or share it with a patient, share it with a colleague, now you increase your retention by 90%, 90%. And now it becomes yours forever. So I challenge every viewer here to take action before midnight tonight on something that you've learned. Also, a call to action is share it with a loved one, share it with a son, daughter, mother, share it with a significant other. And if you remember it well, you can actually share it with a patient when you get back to work. And um, so email me, follow me on Instagram. I'm available and I love to share because it's selfish because this information goes deeper into my own brain every time I share on Instagram. No, it's true. I think we're all looking for uh, ways to improve our efficiency. It's, but we're usually looking at either buying a, a piece of equipment or, uh, or, or implementing a new policy or you know, some, t some type of technology to increase efficiency. When in fact, I think uh, really what we can gain immediate and tremendous results from is increasing our own efficiencies uh, through physical activity, through diet, through just good daily practices. And I think this was one of the most important topics to discuss, uh, getting back into normal life. And, and, and in general, as dentists, I think we have a high stressful position. Um, but now more than ever, our immune systems need to be in tip top shape. And uh, not only us, but our assistants, our staff, uh, mm -hmm. our patients. I think this is a really important topic. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I think the global, the global summit and uh, the amazing peer-to-peer uh, -peer network that we have here about sharing information with our fellow dentists. Uh, and this is what it's all about, is, is sharing our insight and sharing uh, this wonderful information. I invite everyone to uh, visit your website and to uh, contact you on social media. Tell us where we can find you, doctor. Oh, well, one of the best, uh, my Instagram is probably the best place. I, I interact there more often. So Instagram is um, at fit speakers. So I'm not sure if they can chire on that at the bottom. So it's uh, at fit speakers. So I'm, I'm there a lot today. Um, they can follow me on Facebook, but they can't friend me because I've maxed out. I don't have a business page. For some reason, I've been maxed out after two years. Um, the other option is uh, my, my, my uh, website, which is drucci.com. So D-R-U-C-H-E.com. I even have my phone number there for crying out loud. Don't ask me why I'm so transparent. I don't care. So I have email there. I have my phone number there. There's articles they can download, um, all kinds of information. Ultimately, I'm here to serve and share with my colleagues how can they can hack their body so they can have the, the, the most satisfying professional life, uh, a good body, give them a long career, a good functioning brain. And ultimately, I challenge my colleagues to, to be your patient's best role model for overall health. Like, why can't you be the healthiest person in your office? Like, why can't you be the healthiest person every time you talk to a patient? And if you're not, that could be the personal challenge for you, too. You know, so um, be your patient's best role model for overall health. And they smell it. They see it. They feel it. And it makes your treatment plan so much easier to say yes to. Uh, There's no stopping a person that's on fire with, with, with health. So, so my challenge is share, post, contact me, and let, let's make this, let's ignite our patient's uh, desire for health and, and get it back to where it should be, which is optimal, 24 hours a day. Amazing. Well, it's such a pleasure, Dr. J. I'm a, I'm a fan, and I will uh, definitely start implementing some of these uh, immediately myself. I think we can all use a little bit more sleep. Who knew you had to convince people to sleep a little bit more? <laughs> but uh, I, I certainly appreciate it. I think our audience appreciates it. And uh, it was such a pleasure having you on. And we look forward to hearing more from you. And uh, definitely we'll be following you on Instagram and uh, sharing this information with our patients as well. So uh, I, I appreciate your time. We wish you all the best. And uh, and at this point, I think uh, we, will, we will go ahead and end this seminar and share this uh, with our colleagues around the world. Sure, let's get back to work. That's right. Yeah, let's, let's get back to work and let's stay healthy and, and, and uh, be productive and, and try to recoup some of these losses we have by increasing our efficiency. So I'm, uh, I'm a believer. All right. Thank you so much, doctor. You have a wonderful day. Well, my pleasure. You too. Enjoy, enjoy your day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah, goodbye.